I've been a developer for more than seven years at the Open State Foundation, and I'll be talking about democracy eventually digitally transparent, question mark. So just a short introduction. This is the Open State Foundation team. Um, <laughs> there's a new person right there, as you can see. Um, we're based in Amsterdam, um, and there are about a team of eight people, two, three developers, and some people that work on lobbying, uh, project management, research, and things like that. Um, Open State Foundation exists since 2012. We're a merger of two other organizations at New Estema, the New Voting, which tried to bridge the gap between politics and public using digital tools, and Hack the Government, Hack the Overheid, which was an organization that organized many hackathons and events uh, to open up the government. Um, so where do we, what, what do we focus on? There's many things in government, and we try to cover it as much as possible. Um, we've uh, broken it up in some, into some themes, so elections are really important to be as transparent as possible. You need to know how and where you can vote, you need to know that the results are correct, and you know, at this moment in the Netherlands, we get the early results via a media company, which is weird, because the government should just provide the results. Um, so there's a lot of transparency needed there. Then you have the politicians that are elected that will make a lot of decisions, um, how do they uh, come to these decisions, what decisions are made, they should be all as public as possible. And with these decisions come a lot of financing and, and money that, that's being spent. Uh, where is it being spent on, Does it, is it cor uh, used correctly? And in the end you have like, the result, so what society do we end up with? Uh, can we measure this, can we uh, maybe reuse data that governments collects to perform its, its duties. Um, basically, transparency has many, many advantages. So um, with government, you, you can hold government accountable, which is really important. Uh, you can have commercial uh, reuse of the data. There's often more value in a data set than you can imagine at, at the start. Um, and it makes, makes things much more efficient. For example, data sets that we often publish the, the biggest reusers are government organizations themselves because suddenly they can easily access the data via an API or a nice search interface. Um, so it would be just much easier if they publish this data themselves in, a, in an open and transparent way. So basically we do this uh, in two ways. We try to accelerate the opening up of all the data and then we promote the reuse of these data sets uh, via hackathons and meetups and events. Enough about uh, open state, uh, let's just get into the talk. Don't read everything here, just pick, pick some sentences. This is an, an old list that's been going around, it's called the 50 Shades of No, um, because it's really easy to not be transparent and to not open up. Um, and many of these reasons make sense. I mean, they, 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 they can be like uh, gut feelings to, to not open up because it's scary and you're vulnerable, but um, many of them, I mean, too expensive is at the top of the list. Yeah, it's going to probably cost some money, so, so it, you have to fix that. The thing is, if there's like one reason to, to say no to open up, you can solve it. But most of the times there's a collection of no's coming together and you, know, you see that, that a government stagnates and doesn't open up and, and publish the data that they should publish. Um, so I'll be going through some uh, projects that we've done in the past couple of years and show you how we've uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> gotten a lot of no's and how we've overcome them. Um, so let's start with open spending. Um, this is a website, openspending.nl, um, where we publish all the budgets and spending of local uh, governments in the Netherlands. So municipalities, water councils, which is fun to know that it's like the oldest democratic institute in the Netherlands is managing water. Um, uh, provinces, uh, provinces and uh, collaborations between municipalities. Back in 2012, 2013, we, uh, we heard that all these local governments um, 
publish their, their uh, spending and budgets in a standardized format and uh, send it to the national government so they could check if everything is okay. So we started asking, uh, like, the, the statistics office in the Netherlands, CBS, Centraal Bureau for Statistiek, um, they collected all these budgets and spending of all local governments. Could you just publish this? Could you just, you know, put it on a website in an API or whatever? They were already publishing a lot of data, and they said, no, it's not our job. Um, and they said, it's not ours. We don't have authorization from the data owner, which is true. The, the municipalities and local governments were still the owner of these, these files. Um, so they wouldn't publish it, and what we started doing was just asking as an NGO, as people part of society, can we have this file? But there's hundreds of these, of these local governments, so you have like 300, back in the days, 370 municipalities, and there's 12 provinces, and hundreds of, of collaborations, and water councils, so we emailed them and called them for years and started to gather all these files and put them on openspending.nl. Um, so after a few years, we had a, a good collection, like a third of all these local, of local governments were covered on our website and we had them on a map so you could see these are transparent and these are not. And this started a whole discussion uh, within this, this um, space of, of local governments because some would say, why isn't my local municipality on, on this website, and how do we get there? And, and then some other would, somebody else would say, no, we don't give away this file, but why don't we give away this file? Um, because all the other municipalities are already on there. Um, so this, this website created a lot of pressure on the local governments to finally say, okay, maybe <laughs> this makes sense, it's just budgets and spending, which should be open anyway. Um, let's just asked the statistics office to publish it all, and the statistics office finally said, okay, now it is our job. So uh, we now, since quite a few years, have, have all the local governments covered for like, there's 12 years of data, and, and well, it's a big data set, um, and we're really happy with this. Um, I think it's still, in the world, quite special to have a standardized budget and spending of, of local governments on, on just, yeah, available. Then again, it could be better. Um, we, it's only high-level data. It's only like how much has been spent on sports or culture, and maybe a bit more specific than that, but uh, in the end, spending goes way down until the receipt level, the, the bonnetjes. Um, why not publish this? I mean, just to <laughs> give a, a, a short disclaimer, Open State Foundation is likes transparency, but we also like privacy. So we don't want you know, personal information to be published. We don't want state secrets to be published. But many information is just easy to publish, and there's, there's no reason not to do it. Um, so we're currently working with, with government to create a new standard to publish even you know, up to way more levels deep uh, of, of uh, budget and spending data. Let's move to the next uh, project that we've done. Uh, it's called uh, Where is my STEM Local or Where is my polling station? Um, this is again a project where you think, doesn't government already do this? Um, they, they, they obviously organize the elections, so they know where the polling stations are. They probably publish it online, right? And they do, but in the Netherlands, municipalities organize all elections. So, uh, even the national elections or European elections. And there's, at this moment, like 345 municipalities. Um, and they can be big municipalities, small municipalities, and they have many ways <laughs> in which they publish their voting stations. Uh, the best ones have like an interactive map like we do. Um, but many just publish a PDF with addresses which isn't really <laughs> helpful if you quickly want to see what, what voting station you want to use. Uh, and it's not really usable, the data. So we again asked you know, the uh, ministry and the municipalities, can't you just publish this uh, in a nice standardized way uh, as a big data set because we don't want 345 small data sets that differ. We want all the information. And we got the question, but who's going to use this? Which is a fair question again. So the first year we did this was 2017, and we manually 
uh, collected all the information of all the municipalities, which was, well, a lot of work. Um, and it was used by nearly a million people. So apparently people do want this information, and it's useful, and you can use it for analyses after, after the elections. Um, so they were convinced we, this should be maybe <laughs> a project that, that is financed, and we got some financing to do this. Um, but still, at this moment, at, when, we, when we first asked municipalities, OK, so this website is necessary. Please publish your voting stations on this website. And we created the standards to, to do this in a standardized way so other people could reuse it uh, and, and exactly know what data to expect. 50% um, of the municipalities uh, gave us their information. And we still had to collect the rest of the 50%, which was, again, a lot of work. Um, and the rest, the 50% that didn't publish it would often say, we've already published the data. It's already in a PDF, or we have our own screenshot of, an, of a map, or sometimes a nice interactive map. Uh, but many would, again, it's, it's, a good, it's a good reason to say, why should we duplicate this data? And this is, again, a technical problem, because, well, as many of you know, you don't want to duplicate data around. That's, this gives a lot of issues. Um, but we're not there yet, and we're not at the point where each municipality has all its data available in a nice standardized API that can be used you know, across all municipalities in, in, an, in an easy uh, cron job or anything. Um, so we still need them to centrally publish it to our website. Um, and by now, 80% of the municipalities do it. So that's, that's already a big improvement from the 50% that we started at. Um, another nice thing that you can do with this data is uh, now that you know the exact locations of all the nearly 10,000 polling stations in the Netherlands, when the election results are published, uh, the location again of the, of the polling stations isn't shown, but the name is shown and the ID of the, of the polling station. So we can match these and create amazing images, which we did together with uh, the Volkskrant uh, for the last several years. Um, so people can know how, how do people vote in this area. Um, and this obviously wasn't possible if we didn't get all this data standardized and, and available for the whole of the Netherlands. Another uh, big topic that we've been working on for 10 years is the Handelsregister, um, the company register, um, the Kamer van Koophandel, Chamber of Commerce in the Netherlands um, runs it. Um, but you have to pay. So that's an obstacle uh, that we wouldn't want there. Uh, I mean, this, uh, there's actually a lot of external com uh, companies that in bulk buy all this data and then sell it as a subscription model for cheap. But then again, you need a subscription or, or you just need to pay per view on each company that you want the information on. So this, this is a huge obstacle on, on a public register but it doesn't really feel public if, if, if you have these obstacles. Um, so we ask, can we publish this? And the, the, what they say is it's too expensive, because once this is free and, and, open and uh, as open data, the Chamber of Commerce, the KVK, uh, probably loses about 40 or 50 million <laughs> in revenue each year, which is a problem for them, because that's a big chunk of their budget. Um, so we would ask the, manage, uh, the Ministry of Economics, which is the, the, the ministry that, that um, um, the KVK belongs to. Um, but the ministry so far also didn't want this changed. And, and it's in, in a sense, it's easy. They should just pay 40 or 50 million to the Chamber of Commerce, and then it can be opened. Yes, it's a lot of money, but it's also a lot of value that currently isn't uh, realized. So how many people don't look up information about the company and make a wrong decision? Um, what kind of analyses could be done with, with this information that isn't done at this moment? What kind of fraud or corruption is, could, could be protected, which is really hard to do because the data isn't open? So yeah, 40, 50 million is a lot of money, but I guess there's probably more money uh, uh, lost at this moment because it isn't open. And it can be open. Our neighbors in the United Kingdom have the company's house, and they just publish it. They just publish it all. I mean, this is Google. Uh, you see the, the recent filings. 
view PDF and you, you can view it. it. It feels so weird if you just have to pay euros and do an, a transaction online in the Netherlands and here you can just click it and search it. And, um, yeah, so it is possible. It's just a choice and a kind of political will that is necessary in the Netherlands for, for, for it to open up. Um, a short slide that is related, there's a new register uh, about companies, that's the Ultimate Beneficial Ownership Register. Um, it's a, uh, mandated by the EU and has uh, come into action in the past year. Um, but each country had their own choice in how they implemented it. And in the Netherlands, again, the Chamber of Commerce, the KVK, <laughs> managed this, manages this, this register and again they ask money for it. So I know a lot of people are annoyed with having to fill in that their, uh, their ownership with their, their company or, or their uh, organization they're part of. Um, but I guess most of the value of this data is again locked behind a paywall. Um, moving on, the Tweede Kamer Open Data Portal or the House of Representatives Open Data Portal in the Netherlands. Um, in 2012, the, the, the um, um, people at the House of Representatives, the representatives, um, voted to, uh, to open up all the information that they, they created during their job. So all the, all the amendments, motions, votings, the questions that are asked. Um, they said, yeah, we should just digitally publish this all so people can see this and, and, and analyze it. Um, but it wasn't opened up in 2012, it was opened up in 2016. So it took them four years to, to you know, get the IT working and, and publish this via an API. And, and um, we were happy, we were like, okay, it took four years, but now we can access it. And, but then you apparently need to register and you had your IP <laughs> whitelisted before you could access it, which was kind of weird, because why would you, again, create obstacles for us to, to access this information? Um, why they did this is because um, the API was directly <laughs> linked to their, their internal backend, their internal database. <laughs> so they thought, well, we must make sure that not too many people access this. Guess what? Many people access it, and it would cause their internal systems to crash or slow down. <laughs> um, so they closed it up in 2016. And it took six years. I'm sorry, I think you can't see it here, but it took six years again. Just last month, they finally managed to cache it in a cloud <laughs> and open up their API without obstacles. So yeah, it took 10 years. We're happy with the end results, but it took 10 years, which is insane, and shows that there's not a lot of yeah, political will or priority for this information to be opened up. Because it isn't that hard. <laughs> it's not like a 10-year IT project hard. Um, Another project of ours, uh, uh, lobbying. So in 2018, um, the ministers, ministers in the Netherlands decided to publish their calendars, their, their meetings and agendas, um, which is a, a good idea. Um, you could see uh, up front where they would be going, and, and, and in the end you could analyze, oh, they talk to these people, and, and, and well, good idea. And they published it on rijksoverheid.nl, like the main government website. Last year, uh, a colleague of mine analyzed this information. These are all the meetings per month in the last couple of years. Um, and we were looking at them, we were like, some ministries obviously should have more appointments than this, uh, because it would amount up to like a few meetings per week or something like that, and that wouldn't be a really productive minister if that was true. So obviously not all the meetings were put online. Um, in the last year, you see that there's again a spike. So apparently, our research <laughs> affected them to, to you know, more proactively uh, publish their meetings on the website. Um, but still, I'm confused with a site like this. The ministers most likely use a calendar tool, maybe something from Microsoft, maybe something from another vendor. These tools all use the iCalendar protocol and standard at the back end, and you know, this, this can be easily shared online. 
And if you have a private meeting that needs to be hidden, you can make a meeting hidden. So why do they ask their assistants to maybe once a week put their information on a website when they can just easily share the calendar that they already have? So this is also a theme that I'll end this, this talk with, that we should just keep it simple and use open protocols which already exist because many of these tasks aren't that difficult and are already solved. Um, related to this is the transparency register in the European Union. So where in the Netherlands, the ministers publish their own calendars. In the European Union, as a, as a lobbyist, as someone that wants to talk to a commissioner, you first need to register on their website, which is interesting. There's like 12,000 people or companies registered. Um, and you have nice information uh, because all these companies or organizations have, their, have an ID so you can see how many times they talked to a minister. So in the end, I think it should be a combination of both of these systems. So just publish the calendars from your calendar tool and also have some kind of ID of all the people that talk with, with the, the ministers and commissioners. A best example is uh, uh, the digital minister of Taiwan, Audrey Tang, uh, which is a prolific programmer, by the way, and it's amazing that she's been a minister for many years already, and, and she's really pushing the transparency uh, yeah, cause there. If you have an interview or a meeting with Audrey Tang, it will be taped, it will, put, will be put on YouTube. So you're, you're just having a seat at the table. You can hear everything that's being said. You can see everything that's being said. Um, yeah, so shout out to Audrey Tang and showing how it should be done and, and what's possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's move on to freedom of information requests. Uh, in the Netherlands, it's called Wet Openbaarheid van Bestuur, which is the law that was just replaced with the Wet Open Overheid two months ago. Um, we did a research at the beginning of this year, together with uh, partners of ours, um, and, and take a look at the national level, how long it took for them to publish uh, the documents requested by Freedom of Information Request. 161 days. So that's like, you're waiting half a year, maybe even longer, because this is an average, um, for documents that you requested that you have your legal right to. Um, these lines show the, the, uh, the maximum amount of days that legally they have. It's 56 with the old law and 42 days with the new law. So yeah, they're, they're going to have to work on, on moving <laughs> their response time down. And I can understand why this is, because I, I talk to a lot of civil servants, um, and they say, oh, it's so annoying if people ask this information. I have to look in, in email boxes of colleagues that have left five years ago, and I can't even open the box, and then I have to go to all these network drives and duplicate do uh, documents and all these things. So obviously the, the information systems used by the government aren't equipped to quickly deal with freedom of information requests. Um, and there, that's the big problem. And there's a good example of, of, of a country that can do it a lot faster. As you can see, Norway, three days. How is this possible? How can Norway... It, it, it just blows my mind. So let's look at Norway. We interviewed them. Uh, they have a great website. It's called A Insin. I'm not sure if I pronounced it correct, which means something like electronic insights, transparency. Um, and as you can see over here, 64 million documents and emails are directly searchable and requestable via this website, which is great. I mean, the Netherlands is working on a website like this as well. It has like 200,000 documents, and they're having a big, big troubles with scaling this up. Um, I also love that, that this is just like a, a shopping cart, so you can order things which aren't di directly accessible in the system, and it will go to your shopping cart, and you can just order as much as you want because it's free. Um, some documents are directly available. You can just open them up. Here you see the shopping cart. Um, and I've done this. I've j it, it, they don't restrict where you come from, so I've just requested many documents. And with a few days, they, they sent you via email all the documents and emails that, that, that civil servants sent. It was 
I was really amazed by, by how they do this. So how does Norway do this? Well, first of all, they use the metadata standards that's used across the government. Um, obviously, it's still a work in progress. It, it, it can be scaled up even, even further, but they're a long way. Um, and it's, it's, it's a simple metadata standard. It's just, you know, what's the date of this document? Uh, is there a subject or a title? Things like this. Who's the owner? Um, but because it's standardized, they can publish it on their, their e-Insin website and make it searchable and requestable. And um, then there's a culture of openness and trust. Um, the government in Norway trusts society to, you know, not <laughs> not be too <laughs> picky on their their vulnerability by showing all their information. Um, and it, it, this is true. I mean, there's going to be mistakes that's going to be shown in this data. And, and, um, but by opening up all your information, you end up gaining trust. And even if you make mistakes, people will kind of accept it because they know, okay, obviously nobody is perfect. Government can be perfect either. So let's just um, maybe work with them. And there's probably scandals and things like this. And it could be better in Norway also. But... It's, it's, it's a, a, a positive circle where the government trusts society and society trusts government. And this is a big issue in these days because trusting government is, I think, going down in many countries. Um, so opening up in Norway has reversed this trend or made, made sure that this trend doesn't, doesn't happen there as much. Then again, transparency also has priority. So besides like a, a culture, it's also political will. If you get a freedom of information request in Norway, you have to drop all your other work and just handle the request ASAP. Um, even if, 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 you, if, if it takes too long, or if you don't uh, open up everything, it, apparently they don't even um, black out much of the, of the documents, which is kind of seen as, a, as something you don't do in Norway, whereas in the Netherlands, there's many examples of documents that are completely black because everything is blacked out. Um, but if, if, if a citizen isn't uh, happy with, with the time uh, it took for this, this information to be published or the information that they got, they can file a complaint and this complaint goes directly to the king. And every week the king looks at these complaints and addresses the ministers and saying, why, why wasn't this information provided? So it's, it's, a, it's a way of, of, of political will and courage in Norway, which we in the Netherlands at least can, can learn a lot from. Um, so the final slides will be more of a, yeah, thinking about where should we go? What, what kind of inspiration do we need? What is possible? What would make sense for governments to work in the open? Because at Open State Foundation, we've, we've focused a lot on data sets, but as you've seen with these freedom of information requests, it's mainly also documents and emails and text messages, which hold a lot of inter interesting information about the functioning of government. Um, but this is a really messy kind of data. It, it's, it's not a, a clean data set which you can easily publish. It, it means that you have to look at the, at the, yeah, the, the structural way that, that government works and, and make sure that that's easily opened up. Um, so inspiration number one, GitLab. Uh, GitLab is, is quite, well, actually, I'd say radically transparent as a company. It's just a public company. They create an open source, well, Git cloud platform, obviously, and, and, and software platform. Um, but they have a handbook, which is, is, well, largely open. You can just read about all their internal ways they work and decisions they make. Um, they use uh, public trackers. Well, let me just read the quote. Be open about as many things as possible. By making information public, we can reduce the threshold to contribution and make collaboration easier. Use public issue trackers, public projects, and public repositories when possible. So because they codified this information in their handbook and actively pursue it, they have a really open culture in, in quite a large company by, uh, by now. Another quote, which I think is even more interesting, I'll read it. Most companies become non-transparent over time because they don't accept any mistakes. Instead, we should always err on the side of transparency when there is a choice to be made between caution or inaction and transparency. 
And this, this ties in great with the 50 Shades of No list that I started with, because if you don't actively try to be transparent and open, you'll, you, you'll feel the pain and the vulnerability of being open, and, and you'll close up again and, and don't publish anything anymore, and it, the default will be non-transparency. Um, so GitLab also, like Audrey Tang, publishes a lot of stuff on YouTube. They, they actively uh, ask their, their um, uh, people to you know, have, li have their meetings, live streams on YouTube. And it's a, a company that works mostly remote. So these, their meetings are already online. And they just live stream them on YouTube. And they, you, can, you can look them back. And it's insane. There's like thousands and thousands of videos and many uh, that are uploaded each day. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great that they, they are so transparent and show that even a public company can be this transparent. So a government which kind of has the duty to be transparent should be easily be able to do something like this. Another inspiration uh, is, of, of course, you know, successful open source projects that work in the open. For example, Linux, obviously. I mean, they do all, all their communication via mailing lists. It's been doing this for 30 years. <laughs> it's really successful. Um, sure, it's probably not perfect, but if, if you know, uh, an organization like Linux can communicate this successfully using just mailing lists, why can't government do this? And finally, again, back to my, my favorite minister in the world, Audrey Tang in Taiwan. Um, another example of her transparency is that if you uh, ask, uh, ask written questions via email or uh, ask for a written interview, she'll say, just post it on the forum <laughs> because I'll answer on the forum and maybe other people can answer it as well. It's just so simple. Um, why, why, why shouldn't information that is hidden in emails just be open in a forum if you communicate with government. And, well, Audrey Tang, again, is leading the way in this. Um, so to uh, finish up, keep it simple, again, question mark, just use open standards, use open protocols, use open source, um, and just some crazy ideas. I mean, files and documents at government, why don't they just use a public Nextcloud instance? Hide the, hide the documents that you don't want to publish, or maybe create an add-on that you can redact some stuff, but just start with Nextcloud, and I think you'll move along really quickly with, with opening up. Um, email, again, you, you know, just use mailing lists, public mailing lists, chat. Chat isn't used as much in government, I think, but if they use chat, they use text messages or WhatsApp. Not good. Maybe just use a public matrix instance. Um, so in the end, open government requires courage from top down, from ministers. Um, it sounds really crazy that it's something like courage that is necessary, but if, if the ministers don't show that there's a political will to open up, it won't happen. And Norway is doing this already quite well. Then again, you also need courage from bottom up. You need civil servants, and I know many of them that are already working on this, that actively try to push the agenda of opening up and publish, publishing information that isn't published at this moment and asking questions why it isn't possible. And most important, I think, even is pressure from society. Um, I'd say that transparency organizations aren't as as, uh, as, as, as well-known or as visible or, or as maybe as sexy as privacy organization for, for uh, privacy digital rights. But a thing that we always say at Open State Foundation is um, government shouldn't know much about citizens. So that's what privacy organizations do. What we do is making sure that citizens know much about the government. And you need both to, to be uh, in a healthy healthy. Uh, just society. So support your local, <laughs> local digital rights, uh, digital transparency and open data NGO. UK has the Great My Society. Uh, Germany and Belgium have the Open Knowledge Foundation and they're also in Finland and many other chapters. France has uh, Regard Citoyen, Access Info in Spain and also uh, they work at a lot of stuff in, in Europe, Open Polis in Italy. Well, in every country or region there, there is an organization working on this. But don't take it for granted. Sunlight Foundation used to be the biggest, 50 people working there in 2012. They are gone now since two years. So 
I mean, it, this isn't because transparency is solved in the US. <laughs> it's kind of weird that, especially in the US, Sunlight Foundation just died, and uh, that's a shame. So support your local NGO. Um, that's it. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. We, we've got time for a few questions. Um, and if people could ask questions at the microphone, as someone is. And also, seeing as we're competing with the flamers and the music, please kiss the microphone, almost kiss it, and be nice and clear. So, um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I work with some civil servants in a municipality in the Netherlands, and they are opening up to our pleas for uh, well, open source and opening up, etc. But I have the impression that when they uh, bring this up in their own organization, they meet IT managers that give them the Fifty Shades of No. And then they are kind of helpless because they are not tech-savvy IT experts themselves, so they don't have an adequate reply. Right. Do you have any resources that I could pass on that could help them, like the, the arguments that are really compelling that they could bring up internally, and maybe uh, a cookbook of solutions that might help the IT manager that they would have to confront? That's a good, good question, and it's difficult to, to directly answer because I don't know the, the, the specific questions that, that are happening in this, this case, but there's, there's, like I said, 50 shades of no. I think it's actually 46, but you know, there's many reasons to say no, and there's also many answers. And like, as I've shown with the projects that, we've, that were successful or, or partly successful or not successful, it's, it, it takes like a specific approach in each case. So I'd be happy to talk uh, to you uh, about some of the specifics <laughs> that, you, that you run into and uh, maybe have a look at that. Thanks. Actually, I, I can add one little thing to that. Sometimes one thing I found dealing with government is rather than asking for permission, um, ask for objections. And if you ask for, do you have any objections to publishing this information, they have to give specific reasons and you can then go against those. But yeah. maybe, that, maybe that's the picture. Yeah, that's also good. Again, but yeah. Then you exactly know what's wrong and <laughs> work on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry, go. Go, go. Sorry, get next question. Yeah, I'm thinking about what you just said, but uh, that's something else. Oh, sorry. Else, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you might need to take your mask off just to speak. Yeah, if you... I think so. Yeah, because I mean, government doesn't have to reply to you, actually. So, but that's something else. So my question is, because you mentioned Norway and you mentioned uh, Taiwan, I think, uh, but these seem like outliers. I mean, in, in my opinion, in my view, I think, what, what happens in the Netherlands is actually pretty normal. So are there other outliers or good examples? I, I, well, I yeah, that, that's true. They're, they're, they're definitely outliers and it's, I, I wouldn't, I, I'd say the open data and digital transparency movement is about 15 years old. And the first, well, five to 10 years was basically just telling what the idea of open data was. And it took a lot of effort to get this, this idea uh, you know, known across governments. In the past seven years, I'd say um, m most people in government know about being digitally transparent and know the term open data. So that is definitely progress and more data has been published. Um, so I think the trend is in the right direction, but it could be much faster. And these, these outliers like Norway and, and parts of Taiwan, because it's only Audrey Tang. Well, Taiwan is doing great at many places, but Audrey Tang is, is also an outlier within Taiwan. Um, yeah, the, it, I, yeah so, so your question is, are there more outliers? Um, I f yeah, there, there's good examples in many countries. I mean, in, uh, the UK is doing great at some place, uh, so, uh, in some cases, and the uh, US as well. Um, but it changes a lot over time. Um, yeah. I think it's going in the right direction, but maybe we can talk afterwards as well and then discuss some more. Thanks. Uh, go, go, go. Two examples you gave, uh, the uh, company register, KVK and uh, Uber register, that is about uh, individuals. Um, do you talk to Bits of Freedom about the privacy implications of what you're striving for? Because there definitely are privacy implications. Lots of independent workers here 
at camp know that you, you get spammed to death once you're in the register. Yeah. And Ubo is even worse with unforeseen consequences where people are actually leaving the Netherlands because they're afraid of the well-being of their children and family. Yeah, no, those are, those are, are uh, valid, valid criticisms. Um, starting with the company register, I mean, every country has a company register, so this is just a register that, that is necessary for a functioning ec economy. Um, it is already a public register, it's just made more public for people with a lot of money. <laughs> So to level the playing field, I, I think it makes much more sense if the, the, the paywall is removed. Again, there's, in the Netherlands specifically, there's a lot of private information in this Handelsregister, uh, uh, in the Companies Register. I think they're trying to fix this slowly but surely uh, to remove as much of this uh, really personal information and just you know, keep the, the company information left, uh, leave, that, leave that information and make sure that that's available. So, uh, your first question, <laughs> the UBO uh, registers. Um, yes, this is, this is actually information about people that own parts of companies or organizations. Um, it's still interesting to see that some countries in, in Europe are much more open with this data and the, 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 yeah, the fears of, of uh, will these people be harassed or, uh, or, or things like this, they don't seem to be a big problem. And even if there is like a, a really legitimate concern about the person's, person's uh, safety, some countries have like a clause that they could hide their information, but they have to show that they're you know, targeted explicitly. Um, so I'd rather say, let's try to open up and see if it's a big problem. In other countries, it doesn't appear to be a big problem. And it is a lot of really interesting information to know who actually owns a company or who actually owns multiple companies, who is the person behind uh, certain, certain interests. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely uh, 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 something to balance. But I'd say, again, let's try to be more open instead of closing up, because that's the easy way to do. To do. And it's, it's, it takes a lot more effort to open up and stay open. Thanks. Of course, at first, thanks for the talk and thanks for everything you said. Yeah. And um, I was just wondering about, are there any, um, do you have any tips or any um, steps to follow? Because what you say, it's, it's like information, it's like awareness about transparency. Uh, it's not the willingness to not be transparent, but it's mostly awareness and sometimes willingness, but most of the time, just the effort it takes, like you said. Are there any tips or anything civil servants could do to uh, promote uh, of make more people aware of transparency or any steps to follow to make sure that you work as transparent as possible yeah good good question well mainly what I ended with so so uh, we have an international crowd here uh, support your local <laughs> digital transparency NGO uh, or, or sometimes they're regional but there's always uh, an, an organization focusing on, on, on a country or a region um, you know, subscribe to their mailing lists, donate. Uh, I mean, I think Open State Foundation just has a handful of monthly donors, which isn't a lot. So, more would be would be awesome. <laughs> um, and just spread awareness. Just talk to people. Um, yeah, um, maybe you, if if you're a developer, work together with these NGOs because it's often a lot of technical stuff that needs to be done. If you're not a developer, um, freedom of information requests are really easy. There's often even tools. My society built a great tool called What Do They Know? And it's been ported to many countries. Uh, and you, it's just a click of the button to, to uh, request uh, information and you know, publish it, put it uh, on, a, on, a, on a website, link to it on Twitter or, or Mastodon or whatever, and, and you know, uh, try to open things up. But uh, yeah, I think there, there are quite some steps to be taken. So thanks. There we go. Another question here. Yes. Uh, hello. Um, so, uh, Ray, the whole uh, company registry and who owns things, you can go to the Danish uh, authority, cvr.dk, and download it all as a database. Yeah, that's amazing. And that has brought a lot of businesses who use that data and the changes to generate new stories. And that will be, so this person who previously owned this is now on the board of that. Yeah. And that has been quite successful. But my question was, 
Can we support you and buy you a lovely T-shirt or some similar? Okay, uh, what was your last, last sentence? Can we get the T-shirt? T-shirts. Yes. The t -shirt. Can we ah, buy your T-shirt? I even have a, 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 a much better sweater, which we still have a few of but that you that you could buy. It's, Is it uh, a hoodie? It's a, or it's a gray hoodie, and yeah, yeah. Uh, the back of it says "Open data or it didn't happen." So I'd rather have the T-shirt. Get in con contact with us, and you can get a get a hoodie. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I've, I've got one last question. You're saying that Norway has a policy of, um, if they get a request, drop everything, answer the request. Yeah. Does that mean that we could DDoS um, Norway? <laughs> well, if people... And I'm mindful the Kremlin are watching the stream right now. It's interesting. I f well, if they just handle their documents as quickly as they currently do, they'll just finish it in a week. So I guess, I guess they're, they're up to it. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed for a very interesting talk, and I hope it goes well. Thank you. Thanks.